All right, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Amelia Merritt um, here at Beeswax and I'm on our customer success team. Today we're going to be talking about the cookie apocalypse with Ari Paparo. So thank you for joining us today. In terms of an agenda of how we're gonna spend this next hour, we're gonna start off with a quick introduction of our speaker. Then we'll go through a briefing on what we know and what we don't know so far. Uh, we'll go through some potential solutions, um, but we're really gonna spend most of the hour taking your questions. So there's a little Q&A tab in the Zoom app. So please type your questions there and you can type them at any time um, and we're gonna answer them uh, during the Q&A portion. After the webinar, we'll be sure to send out a recording to everyone that's registered as well. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, everyone meet Ari Paparo. Ari is the CEO at Beeswax. He's formerly built products at Google and AppNexus. Uh, he created the VAST standard and holds a patent on Nielsen DAR. And he is also very uh, an, a very avid tweeter. Uh, you can follow him um, for all his ad tech tweets at, at Ari Pap. And uh, here's Ari. Thanks so much for that great introduction. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so the impetus for this webinar was obviously the big news coming on two weeks that uh, Chrome has a plan to remove third party cookies. And after that, over the last two weeks, the number of people who've reached out to me um, personally through email, Twitter, et cetera, for various questions has been kind of overwhelming. Uh, and so I wanted to take the opportunity to share what uh, knowledge I have about the subject and some thoughts about it. Um, and then really just open forum for questions. Uh, and we expect to spend, uh, as Amelia mentioned, the majority of our time answering your questions. Um, so um, so please enter your questions in the in the Zoom chat as, as we discussed. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a pretty brief uh, set of slides to talk about uh, what's going on here, uh, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, so I wanted to start by uh, rehashing what Google actually said. So these are all quotes from the uh, Google release on their uh, on their blog. Um, and uh, and so a couple of points. Uh, the first bullet, um, they're confident, we're confident that the sandbox can sustain the ad supported ecosystem in a way that will render the cookies obsolete. So, um, so that's the form foundation point they're making, which is they think that um, this is not an apocalypse. They think this is a transition um, and we can debate that one way or another. Um, the, um, the second point is that they uh, expect the sandbox approaches to um, satisfy the needs of many different parties. Um, they, they talk about tools to m mitigate the workarounds. I think that's kind of an interesting uh, phrasing. Um, and only when that it happens will they plan to phase out support for third party cookies uh, within two years. So that's a lot of uncertainty in those two bullets right there um, in terms of the timing and the dependencies and the and the roadmap to get there. Um, so there was some talk, I don't have the exact quote, there's some talk about where, how the Chrome team wanted to start um, some sandbox um, activities as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, and presumably there have to be tests and then there has to be feedback and then uh, these sandbox activities will be, um, will be submitted to the standards groups. So there's a, really a lot of steps there before you get, to, um, you get to an actual plan to then phase out support. So we could have cookies for two years. It could be, frankly, it could be longer, it could be shorter. Um, and last, and I think this is also a big interesting uncertainty, is uh, developing techniques to mitigate covert tracking and workarounds. So these are uh, fingerprinting related activities. So um, they this gets a lot less press, but at, uh, it certainly could have effects on the way a lot of people do business. Um, if not fingerprinting per se, it's using different signals from the browser for targeting or otherwise um, reaching consumers. So that, that, those are just the excerpts from the Google release that I thought were interesting. Um, let's go into some analysis. And like I said, this presentation is quite brief. Um, so what's the current state? I like to zoom out and say, well, 
30% of the current ad market is blind already. So Safari and Firefox now um, blocking third-party cookies uh, makes that portion of the market invisible to cookie-related act um, techniques. Um, and as a result, we've seen uh, monetization on Safari um, significantly lower than the rest of the web. So um, the number I've heard from several publishers is 60 to 70% lower RPMs when the user is on Safari than on Chrome. Um, so uh, that's interesting and also kind of a little bit um, scary um, if the rest of the web moves in that direction, the advertising business would be um, decimated in digital. I don't think anyone expects it to move exactly in that direction, but it's interesting. Another bullet I want to point out is that click-based conversions still work on Safari, um, assuming that they're instrumented correctly. Um, basically, uh, using Google Analytics uh, and, um, and a click-based uh, attribution system, um, uh, major platforms like our enabled to track conversions of users using the UTM parameter, which is kind of the old fashioned way of tracking uh, activity on your site. Um, so the current proposals of the sandbox, I think we've probably everyone's taken a little gander at some of the sandbox um, projects that are all in proposal stage. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into enormous amount of depth into all of them because they're all very early. Um, but the current sandbox proposals effectively prevent identifying individual users as converters or reached users. They're using various techniques to sort of obfuscate who the users are, uh, to uh, anonymize and group them in cohorts, um, or otherwise to give information in a very um, non-user specific way. I think those, that's kind of the core to those sandbox proposals. Um, so, um, and, and I got a little bit of flack for my ad exchanger article on some of these subjects, but these, these are my opinions, which is that, you know, view through uh, tracking and multi-touch really are not going to work at all as they're currently, uh, as they currently work. Um, they're entirely dependent on third-party cookies. Um, some of the sandbox proposals try to have the browser give information about reach to the, uh, to the advertiser. It's unclear if that is actually possible. Um, secondly, third-party data targeting, as it currently works, would not work at all. So third-party data is overwhelmingly bought and sold on a cookie basis currently. Uh, and we'll talk about the mitigating factors. But in the current world, third-party data marketplaces are you know vast majority cookies um, and they're uh, cookie synced between the provider and the DSP and the original data provider and all that would essentially stop working entirely. Um, and then um, first party retargeting of advertiser data is also kind of on the chopping block. So advertisers will be able to collect first party data about activities on their site, which is great using analytics or other uh, or DMPs or other vendors like that. But enabling that data to work on the open web will not work because that, that first party data becomes third party as soon as it's out on another site. Um, so it looks pretty grim in terms of how the current techniques and ecosystem would adapt to a world without third party cookies. But I will point out once again I, that I think that the industry is somewhat in denial of the first bullet on this page, that 30% of the world already works this way. And, uh, and we're sort of ignoring it. And uh, we've seen some customers just not target users on Safari as a way around this. But, um, you know, iOS users in general are higher income uh, and better consumers than Android uh, consumers on average. So uh, I think we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice in the current situation. All right, so what don't we know? What are the unknowns? There's a lot of them, um, and I brought this up already. Uh, what does within two years really mean? It will, how much visibility will there be? Um, when will we get the final deadline? Um, I think uh, we've seen other uh, kind of deadlines come and go for various privacy-related initiatives, um, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, what will happen to mobile IDs? So this may seem like it's a tangent, a different question entirely than cookies, but I don't think it is. Um, so as I probably everyone on the phone knows, in an in-app environment on Android or, uh, or, or iOS, there is uh, persistent 
identifier that's used extensively for the advertising ecosystems. I believe these two issues are tied because Apple certainly would like to get rid of their mobile ID, um, but feels like they can't until there's a replacement. So the, if the sandbox approach starts becoming widely accepted, and especially if it becomes a standard, it would be a lot easier for Apple to replace the IDFA with a sandbox-like solution. Uh, I don't know the timing of that, but it seems like it's quite um, quite relevant. Um, the um, so this is another point that I think is being missed, which is the current UTM equals uh, click-based tracking. It's unclear if that will still work. Um, so the um, it still works on Safari right now, although in ITP 2.3, um, Apple took some actions to um, limit it um, that seemed to be directly targeting Facebook's approach to using it. Um, and if you read the sandbox uh, proposals for click-based conversions, they uh, are obfuscating the user IDs and putting them in cohorts. So the implication to me is that you would only need that click-based sandbox approach if UTM stopped working. Um, and that's a big implication on uh, some big platforms that do a lot of click-based conversions. Um, next point, will IP addresses be removed? So the sandboxing, um, excuse me, fingerprinting uh, is uh, is kind of a big subject where, um, for those who don't know what it is, it's where you, um, you try to guess or infer the user's identity using all kinds of signals other than cookies. So for example, you might use the IP address plus the browser screen size plus browser plugins installed and things like that. Um, and um, the kind of the secret to fingerprinting is that IP address is like 90% of the solution. Um, the rest of the stuff just adds a little more uh, entropy to the, uh, to the information being stored. So there was a separate report on, I think, CNET or ZDNet that um, the Chrome team is looking into options to stop passing the IP address to, uh, to people down the chain. This would be a big deal uh, as IP addresses are used for geography, IP addresses are used for lots of different things in the ad tech uh, stack. Um, and w the extent to which Chrome wants to pursue anti-fingerprinting um, it's, it will be very interesting to, to be very interesting to see uh, what happens there. Um, so cross-site first-party cookies is a big concern of publishers. So a uh, publisher group of two or three sites owned by the same entity have different domains, but they want to share first-party cookies. Uh, how will that happen? Um, so this has been pointed out as a uh, as a problem with uh, the removal of third-party cookies. Um, SSO as well does not really work well without third-party cookies. Um, and um, and if we think that the future of identity is largely going to be in the publisher's hands, then this is a real problem. And I think the Chrome team said that they were looking into this. So this is certainly on people's radar. Seems like a solvable problem. Um, and then last one is, will first party data work in a third party context? Um, let me unpack that for a moment. So um, the uh, the reaction of a lot of folks when this announcement first happened was, oh, this is this is, gives Google a monopoly on everything. It's great for Google, um, and I think that's based on the um, on the assumption that if Google has a first party cookie from people logging into Gmail and other other places like that, they can then continue to use that cookie for the purposes of advertising off Google. So it was a first party cookie in a third party context. Um, that was originally how Safari's ITP worked, um, and that was kind of a workaround that a lot of the big ad tech vendors had first-party cookies because people had clicked on ads or visited their sites. Um, and then when ITP, I think, 2 came out, they removed that, and that's when the real hammer dropped on ad tech in Safari. Um, so I am assuming that first-party data will not work in a third-party context in Chrome as part of this third-party reduction. Um, if it did work, it would be quite a uh, hand on the scale in favor of platforms like Google, um, and I don't think that that is how they intend it to work, but we don't know. Um, so let's talk about potential solutions. Um, so these may not be all the solutions, but uh, these are the ones that seem to be coming up the most in conversations with ecosystem partners. Uh, and this is uh, potential solutions besides the sandbox. Um, so contextual, everyone knows contextual, it works, but it's not very exciting and only works on a subset of uh, environments. 
Um, I think most of the effort is on the next two. So first party publisher segments. This is the general idea that publishers are going to have first party data. Publishers know a lot about their consumers uh, and publishers can put those users into segments or cohorts and then pass them to the buyers. So imagine a deal ID that was uh, created by the publisher and that uh, indicated to the buyer that the, uh, that the consumers were young women interested in uh, buying a car um, or something like that. Um, and so this is a very viable solution. Uh, and the question is, how would you uh, have a uniform taxonomy across publishers and how would advertisers um, trust the, that categorization? Because it would obviously be in the publisher's interest to put uh, as many great, uh, as many consumers in great segments as possible. Um, the next solution broadly is for, once again, publisher first party data, um, but taking that data, pr presumably an email address, hashing it and sending that hash to the buyers. Um, and probably this would involve a third party uh, who would protect the consumer's privacy and match data between buyers and sellers based on this kind of hashed ID. And this is roughly what LiveRamp announced at their last summit, uh, that they have a, a program by which they're going to help publishers ask for consumer identity and then turn it into the LiveRamp IDL. Um, but there could be other vendors doing similar things. Uh, next, panels. So everyone remembers panel, the good days of panels, Comscore data, Nielsen data, et cetera. Um, and I used to work at Nielsen, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, so panels are opt-in. They track everything on your computer. Um, the challenge with panels are um, applicability across a wide range of campaigns because they have to project the audience. But panels can work for big advertising campaigns and digital. Um, you can get view through. You get all kinds of metrics uh, on a uh, projected basis. And then last, the, the, one of the things that Google has been announcing the, the most about, um, most progress on, is using machine learning in various ways to fill in the gaps. So you move from sort of frequency capping based on cookies where you, you uh, assume that you have accurate data about the consumer and their behavior to um, a machine learning model that estimates frequency and that says, well, we're going to stop serving this ad because it's been seen a certain amount of times on this particular website at this time of day, it's probably over frequency. That, those are, that's a really dumbed down version of what Google has been talking about. Um, Google also is using machine learning to estimate conversions on iOS without an SDK, which is an interesting use case as well. So th those are my view of the five potential solutions. Uh, I think it was my last slide. So how do these solutions uh, measure up against the problems. So um, the across the top of this chart is what are the problems with third party cookies going away, frequency capping, first party targeting, third party targeting and attribution, and then which methods weigh up against them. Um, and what you'll see in this chart is that um, that publisher PII, meaning taking that hashed email address or something like that, that actually solves most of these problems um, if you get scale. If there are enough publishers with enough users getting that information, that is kind of the, I don't want to call it the silver bullet, let's call it the copper bullet, uh, kind of gets you halfway there. Um, the, whereas the other techniques are really good for one thing or another. So uh, for panel, panels are really good for understanding what happened. Where did I see this user? How did, my, how did I um, experience the ad? Um, machine learning, a lot of maybes. You know, certainly frequency capping seems like a pretty, pretty low hanging fruit for estimation. It also doesn't need to be perfect. Maybe attribution, um, unclear. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of interesting things going on um, about how this how this is going to evolve and what the potential alternatives are. Um, now, some of you may be left uh, a little dissatisfied because there isn't a specific answer to specifically what's going to happen. And I think that's just the nature of this problem. It's very complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, and uh, and we're all going to find out over the next you know year or two. Um, so with that, I think we're going to go to Q&A. So, um, so I'll hand it over to Amelia. Great. Um, thanks. So it looks like we have a few questions already coming through on the Q&A tab, but feel free to, to add yours there now. Um, I also have a couple from email from earlier. Um, I would actually like to start it off, though. Um, Eric, can you speak to a little bit about what companies you think might actually benefit from this change? 
Sure. Um, well, obviously beeswax, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that this is an interesting situation here where advertisers are going to want to continue to advertise. They're going to want to continue to measure and, and tweak and optimize what they do, but the techniques are going to change. And I think that's actually a pretty good opportunity for independent ad tech. I'm not just talking in my book here. I think it is a good opportunity for folks to innovate around that, um, around ways of buying ads with this new technology. Um, I think it's a uh, big positive for big publishers. So despite the the risk of RPMs going down, the big trusted publishers can ask for logins and they can put up paywalls and having the currency of real user data is going to be hugely important. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. All right, let's take the first question from the Q&A tab then. Um, this is a question from uh, Vamsi. Um, Will Google Analytics work after removing third-party cookies? Uh, yeah, so Google Analytics currently is on a, is for a first-party cookie. Um, the tags on your page and it's writing first-party uh, information, writing information in the first party and then transmitting it back to Google. Um, so it will work. I think that um, some of the features that Google Analytics has added over the last several years, like integration with Google Ads, for example, or integration, conversion attribution, integration with DCM may be in jeopardy because they may require the information to go across sites. Great. Uh, let's take another question from the Q&A tab here. Um, let's see. This is a question from Brooke. Do we think that there will be regional changes, i.e. GDPR in Europe, that will impact these techniques further? Uh, that's a good question. So um, first of all, I would say this announcement is a lot more important than GDPR from the ad tech perspective. I, I think that the government regulation of, of user data and privacy has been, uh, has been um, an, a, an it has had an impact on the way people do business and has kind of um, removed some of the um, excesses of the ad tech world, um, but this is much more sweeping and much more impactful and will not have any wiggle room. Um, so the tech will, will determine what happens rather than the law. Um, with that said, um, some of the techniques that I talked about that may help to uh, ameliorate the change may also run afoul of privacy advocates, most specifically this idea of passing around a pseudo-anonymized ID that represents a user. I, I imagine the privacy people are not gonna like that. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to a question from, uh, let's see here, there are a lot coming in. Um, here's a question from Ronan. How can IP address be blocked by a browser? All web page assets, HTML, image, uh, JavaScript, CSS, rely on IP addresses to return to a user. Are the IP blindness proposals of Sandbox realistic? What's up, Ronan? Um, so um, that's a tough question. Uh, you know, we were, we were actually scratching our heads about that as well. Uh, IP address is a foundational um, part of the basic web protocols, TCP IP and uh, HTTP. Um, and I'm really not clear how it would be possible. Um, that's probably why they didn't announce anything specific about that subject. Um, perhaps um, there is some concept of proxying. M maybe, um, I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a question from Carolina. Is there any reason for RTB to exist without an ecosystem of third-party data to target users? Right, that's a really good question, Carolina. Um, so I, I was asked this as well on stage at, at Exchange or, uh, Industry Preview last week, and I, I would say that if the if the data didn't exist ten years ago, probably RTB would have been shaped very differently. Um, however. I think that enough infrastructure has been built into RTB that uh, that it will continue uh, in as a way to give the buyers like control over what they're buying in real time, which is kind of what they want, even if the user data isn't as targetable. The, I'd use the metaphor like uh, you know, what if a city has a big old bridge that uh, you know that was meant for lots of cars, and then they decide to switch it over to bicycles. Well, I mean, they probably wouldn't have built the same bridge, but it's there, so the bicycles are going to use it. All right. Uh, this is kind of a 
double question from two people. Uh, so Ian asked, how bad do you think this will be for small to long tail publishers? And we had a similar question uh, from Doris. What would you suggest for publishers to react to this, um, such as expanding subscriptions or whatever? Yeah, so I think small, uh, it depends on the vertical to some extent, but the worst case scenario is a small publisher that is dependent on social traffic. Uh, so if you assume that the publishers are going to need to collect more information about their end users in order to survive, um, then they need a relationship with those users. And the, the kind of clickbaity publishers who get their traffic on sensational stories don't have that relationship and can't build it. Um, and that's going to be a really pretty big problem for them. Um, I think if you're in a vertical where your data is valuable for contextual or, uh, or where the, you have a small dedicated group of consumers, you could be in pretty good shape. Um, what should publishers do? Um, I think absolutely look at paywalls or uh, login walls as, a, as an initiative. Um, I talked to one publisher in Europe who told me that when they uh, changed their GDPR acceptance screen to ask for email and say, if you give us your email, you won't see the screen again, they got 30 or 40% of people to do it. Uh, so I think publishers really need to look at that. For bigger publishers, it may be um, the continued movement to, towards consortium, consortia, uh, where uh, logins are shared across publishers may be a good approach. Um, and, and there's no doubt, zooming out, having nothing to do with cookies, that uh, successful media companies looking for diverse sources of revenue is, is a strong trend. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go on to another question here. This is from uh, Dahl. How have advertisers reacted to this announcement? Are they shifting uh, their focus away from cookies? Yeah, so I've, I think that from what I've seen, advertisers are very concerned about this um, as a disruptive uh, challenge to the way they do business. I, I feel as though many advertisers have gotten to the point with programmatic where they feel very comfortable with certain techniques. Um, to give an example, imagine if you are a CPG brand and you have a relationship with, let's say, Oracle to use their data and you've gotten used to the Oracle uh, data cloud and I'm just using Oracle as an example, and every single order you place, every single programmatic value you place has certain segments to define your audience. Now you're sitting there and you, you've been doing it for years, you know what you know what works, what doesn't, and that suddenly goes out the window. And you have to go to your agency or your tech partners and say, how am I going to replace all these techniques I've gotten used to? That adds a lot of uncertainty. Um, I don't, I haven't heard about any Act, actions taking place, people moving their business or changing tech vendors or doing whatever. But I think that that uncertainty is not what uh, people want to see in, in uh, their marketing their marketing groups. They want to have kind of clear direction forward. And it's also not clear what to do. Like if, if you're an advertiser who's spending a good portion of your, of your media dollars on programmatic, uh, and even if it went away entirely, where would you put your money? Um, you know, the social and search worlds are at equilibrium. So pricing goes up if you put more money there. Um, TV is linear D TV is in decline. Uh, connected TV is very high CPMs and high demand. Um, so money's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. This is um, an anonymous question. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Green discussed the possibility of exposing device IDs for web environments. Do you think this is realistic? Uh, of ex I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Exposing device IDs for web environments. Uh, okay. Is, is this Jeff asking the question? Um, hey, Jeff. Um, so um, I think that the idea that the web browser would have a persistent ID, like an IDFA, is just uh, a, a dream that's not, has no basis in reality. Um, first of all, um, it would be easy for anyone to do it. It could have been a solution years ago, um, and no one has has put it into production or even had a real discussion about it. Really, the only time I've heard anyone talk about it is in the ad tech world. Um, so I'd say it has zero chance of happening. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got another question here about... Um, about the identity friends so will, this is from Carolina, will unified ID initiatives actually be able to counterbalance IDP-like implementations? So I think that the previous generation of unified ID solutions, uh, the ones that 
effectively were cookie based are all pretty much dead in the water at this point um, because they're they're cookie based. Um, I think that uh, per my slides, the um, the only way to create a persistent ID that has scale is to use email address or some other um, identifier that the consumer voluntarily provides, um, and that will clearly have scale issues. Not every consumer wants to use an email address. Um, some sites will not be able to get it. Um, lots of problems with it, but it is the best possible solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a question from Stuart. Is post view attribution possible in the post cookie world? Will it have to go through Google? Right, so um, I, I mentioned this earlier, view through or post view attribution will not be possible on, on uh, to do the way we're doing it now with that because it's all 100% dependent on cookies. Um, the two ways it could be possible are first there are, I believe there is one of the sandbox proposals has some discussion about a way to a way to, around it or a way to do it. Um, I'm still trying to kind of absorb that and see what whether it makes sense to me. Um, and secondly, uh, three ways. Secondly, panels. I mentioned this earlier. If you if you have a media buy that's sufficiently sized, the panel should be able to pick up exposure um, and and um, and model out attribution. And then the third way would be something with a uh, hashed PII, uh, where you would have um, you would have a third party like LiveRamp or someone like that take your exposure data. Um, with their uh, hashed ID and then correlate it to your first party data on who converted. Um, those would be kind of the three best ways. I don't see Google as having a unique advantage here. I don't see how Google gets view through either unless they w do one of those techniques. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a question from Joseph. What do you think happens to pre-bid if Sandbox API takes off, login walls don't really scale, and header bidding monetization drops off due to Chrome third-party uh, third cooking blocking? Uh, will this inhibit pre-bid investment and contribution, seeing as there's so much uncertainty at the moment? Wow, that's, a, that's like one of those apocalyptic in a world gone, gone bad with no pre-bid. Uh, I, I, um, okay, so... I'm not sure how much pre-bid is related directly to Sandbox. So pre-bid has an enormous amount of momentum as a way for publishers to take control over their uh, counterparties in, uh, in an auction environment. Assuming that RTB in general doesn't die uh, and that publishers still want to work with more than one monetiz monetization partner, then pre-bid continues to have a very strong place in, in that ecosystem. Um, I, I think that the, um, the removal of cookies will likely make less dollars flow through programmatic, um, not zero, but less. And, um, and the degree to which um, it's affected will be, um, will be really determine how much effort continues to get placed in these things. So that's a pretty vague answer, but there's too many moving parts for me to give you a specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've gotten a couple questions here about um, post view conversions. So let me start with this one that's anonymous. Um, you mentioned Google using machine learning for frequency caps and attribution. Is this what they are currently doing in your view to track post view conversions on Safari? Um, and another question was how do, how does Google measure post view conversions on Safari? Um, right. So, um, I'm not sure uh, about how they do post view on, on Safari, so I'm not going to speculate. Um, I will say that um, what I am aware of is that they are using machine learning to um, attribute app installs on iOS. Um, so they, um, I think Ronan wrote about this uh, in Adweek last week that um, to some extent Google is has this hybrid measurement for their mobile app installs where on Android, because they own the Android store, they can tell who installed after search click but on uh, iOS, they can't um, without having an SDK in the, uh, in the app. So they're estimating it using machine learning. Uh, who knows how, what the inputs to machine learning are. Uh, and they're actually providing those estimates not as a supplemental metric, but as the currency. They're charging people based on installs that are machine learning based. That's, that's grading your own homework. That's, not, that's, that's like inventing a teacher out of whole cloth and then inventing a, uh, you know, the matrix like classroom and then assigning yourself homework and then having your dog write it. Um, so um, I think the real interesting thing about machine learning, is, and this goes towards sort of antitrust questions, is um, 
the machine learning is only as good as the data that uh, creates it, that uh, the data inputs that the machine learns from. And um, in the case of Google, let's say, let's say that Google's um, click-based attribution, is, a machine learning product, is entirely based on their experience running the Android store, the Play Store. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Like you, you're now, your ad business is dependent on your Android install business, which are totally unrelated. And I think regulators have some questions about those sort of activities. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, here is a question from Jacques. Uh, thoughts on what will happen long-term to the likes of Oracle, IOTA, et cetera, and all other third-party data aggregators outside of Amazon, Google, and Facebook? Yeah, I, I think that third-party data is in for a tough time. Um, the um, mo as I said earlier, most third-party data is sold on a cookie basis right now. Um, so um, moving to a different uh, primary key will be difficult. Um, I think that um, it would be more um, straightforward if the data broker or brokerage was connected to an identity solution. Um, so I think uh, that sort of you know, plays well to LiveRamp, who I've brought up a number of times, where they have a data marketplace and an identity solution. Um, but being able to sell data purely on cookies that have been synced between many parties uh, is kind of a dead end tech, uh, and they're going to have to um, evolve into something different in order to continue that business. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question from Alejo. Can internet providers help solve this crisis by asking users to log, to log in to be able to navigate on the web as it was requested in the old days? Right, the olden days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's another, that should have been a bullet on the things we don't know, which is what is, what are telecoms and ISPs going to do? Um, in the US, um, the um, two of the largest DSPs are owned by telecoms, um, uh, Brightroll and, uh, and Xander. Um, and, in, and throughout the history of internet advertising, telecoms have occasionally uh, dipped their toe and sometimes gotten their toe chopped off uh, in, into this world. But there's no doubt that being at the network layer gives telecoms uh, the ability to do the sort of things that third party cookies do currently uh, and how they can um, use that data without a consumer backlash or a privacy backlash is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's another anonymous question. All right. <laughs> Is, when, it, is it Jeff Green again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. When can we expect Amazon to launch their own browser? I, you know, I joked about this on stage last week. I think it's really possible. I, I think, um, you know, most consumers don't care about privacy at all uh, in, in the context of cookies, right? Everyone cares about privacy in terms of someone looking in your front window, uh, but no one cares about cookies except for regulators and privacy fanatics um, and Chrome engineers, sorry. Uh, so, um, so, Imagine Amazon came out with the Prime browser to 10% off everything you buy plus discounts on stores. I would download it. I'd use it. Probably be better than Chrome. <laughs> Let's make it happen. <laughs> was that Jeff Bezos asking the question? It was anonymous. <laughs> All right. Here's a question from Andrew. How do you see this change affecting the verification vendors, IS, double verify, moat, et cetera? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think that... Um, the the verification vendors don't use user as as much as say third party data providers. They do use it, especially for fraud, um, but they don't use it as much. Um, so I, I think it'll be um, some adaptation, but not you know a radical change in their business. Um, I think that um, you know if you think about you know, say bot detection. Um, any bot can fake cookies very efficiently, so it's not a really good signal for fraud or other things like that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a question from Bomsi. Will the removal of third-party cookies from browsers have an impact on native ads? Wow, you got me scratching my head on that one. Um, well, I think that native ads compared to other forms of ads are, um, are mostly different in terms of the creative, and that's, uh, that's not that relevant. Um, I think that um, to the extent that the native ad networks, the big guys like Outbrain, Taboola, et cetera, are heavily, heavily optimized 
uh, to click. Um, this is certainly going to hurt their ability to optimize as well. But on the other hand, being click based, they will still be able to track that pretty efficiently. So I would say it's kind of a wash. If anything, they're better off than non native kind of businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another anonymous question. Will you still be able to retarget using Google DB360's DSP where the bid request is from Google AdX, given that both will have access to the first party Google cookie? All right, need, a, need to get a whiteboard for that. 